First of all, I would like to tell you that when I first learned of the teachings of the Ascended Masters in 1961, I was a student at Boston University, and I had the good fortune to find a medical doctor who was the leader of the Summit Lighthouse group at that time, and who wove into his teachings, Theosophy, um, Alice Bailey, the Rosicrucians, the I Am Movement, the Bridge to Freedom, and so forth. So it was an eclectic experience with a great deal of information that I devoured round the clock, disturbing him almost at any time, asking thousands of questions about the Ascended Masters, whom I had been seeking for about five years. So very early in my acquaintance with this path, someone from Washington who was part of the group there of the Summit Lighthouse sent me a picture of Pallas Athena. Well, I knew of Pallas Athena, but it was in the background of my mind. Now that I saw her not as a Grecian goddess of ancient mythology, but as a living being who had manifested the fullness of the Divine Mother in the flame of truth, therefore being called the goddess of truth. I looked at that picture and I had that moment of recognition that sometime, somewhere, I had served with her and I was thrilled to make the acquaintance of an old friend. And so thinking back upon that occasion when I had to hide all of my literature in a locked suitcase under my bed, uh, lest family members, etc., should find them and turn me away somehow, to this moment when I can stand before you and rejoice in giving this lecture, it has been a wonderful path and a wonderful road and shall continue forever and forever for all of us. So first of all, I would like you to know that I am quoting from the book, Homer's Odyssey, the translation by Robert Fitzgerald. This translation is considered to be far and above beyond all other translations of the Odyssey into the English language. So we begin. I sing of Pallas Athena, the glorious goddess, bright-eyed, inventive, unbending of heart, pure virgin, savior of cities, courageous. Thus begins one of the Homeric hymns describing Pallas Athena. The Roman Emperor Julian said of her, Unto men Athena gives good things, namely wisdom, understanding, and the creative arts. And she dwells in their citadels as being the founder of civil government to the communication of her own wisdom. Pallas Athena is one of the most important deities in Greek mythology. In Roman mythology, she is identified as Minerva. Her influence spans everything from the administration of government and militaristic pursuits to the delicate arts of spinning and weaving. She is seen in the very personification of wisdom who presides over the intellectual and moral side of human life. Athena was the heart of the spiritual life of ancient Athens. The Greeks adored her as the defender of their cities and honored her with many titles. She is revered as the goddess of war and peace, the goddess of wisdom, patron of arts and crafts, and guardian of cities. Her emblem is the olive, emblem of peace, and her bird is the owl, representative of wisdom. Athena is popularly admired as the martial maiden who inspires and accompanies heroes in their adventures and battles, yet never succumbs to amorous advances, fiercely defending her virginity. She was one of three virgin goddesses who could not be stirred by the influences of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. One of the earliest accounts of Athena appears in the Iliad, where she is a war goddess, inspiring and fighting alongside of the Greek heroes. To possess her favor is considered synonymous with military prowess. According to the traditions of Greek mythology, 
Pallas Athena was the favorite daughter of Zeus, the powerful father of the gods and king of Mount Olympus. Her mother was the goddess Metis, whose name means thought or intelligence. Metis was believed to be so wise that she knew more things than all the gods and men together. As the story goes, Zeus was warned that if he had children with Metis, they would be more powerful than he and would eventually dethrone him. Thus, when Metis became pregnant with Athena, Zeus swallowed Metis in order to prevent the child's birth. Soon after, Zeus became afflicted with a violent headache. <laughs> he went to the smithy god, Hephaestus, who split his skull with a bronze axe in order to relieve the pain. Out sprang the bright-eyed Athena in full armor, shouting triumphantly and brandishing a sharp spear. <laughs> the birth of Athena from the head of Zeus can be seen as symbolic of her rational temperament. Her very nature reflects the triumph of reason over passion as she is consistently unmoved by the emotions of passion or romantic love. Her father is the most powerful and her mother the wisest of the gods and goddesses. Athena is thus a product of the union of power and wisdom. Athena was worshipped all over Greece, but especially as the protecting deity of Athens and Attica. As legend has it, both, Pi both Poseidon and Athena desired to rule Athens. The gods decided that the one who produced a gift most useful to mortals would win the city. According to some versions, Poseidon struck the ground with his trident and produced a horse. According to other accounts, he produced a fountain of salt water. But it was Athena's gift that won the favor of the gods. She planted an olive tree. The gods decided that her gift was more useful to mortals and awarded her the city. The olive tree later became the basis of the city's economy. In art, Athena is represented as a stately figure clothed in armor and bearing her breastplate, the aegis, which no arrow could pierce. The aegis is ringed in serpents and is adorned with a head of the Gorgon Medusa. Athena often wears a golden helmet and holds in her right hand a spear to strike at a serpent near her feet. It has thus been said that she wields the spear of knowledge against the serpent of ignorance. To the ancient Greeks, Athena was known as the spear shaker. They placed her statue on their temples, and when the rays of the sun would dance on her spear, it looked as if she were shaking it. Pallas Athena was the muse and inspiration of Sir Francis Bacon, author of the Shakespearean plays. In her honor, he founded a secret literary society called the Knights of the Helmet, the helmet, of course, of Pallas Athena. It is believed that he used the name Shakespeare partly in tribute to the goddess Pallas Athena, the shaker of the spear. Although many believe that Pallas Athena is merely the name of a mythological goddess, in reality, Pallas Athena is a tremendous being of light who ensouls the cosmic consciousness of truth. Students of the Ascended Masters know her personally as the goddess of truth. The flame of truth is an intense, bright, emerald green. It combines with flaming blue power of God's will and the brilliant golden illumination of the intelligence of God. Thus, we see Pallas Athena in her office of goddess of truth once again representing the embodiment of power and wisdom. The Ascended Masters have explained that the term goddess denotes one who is a cosmic being and who ensouls the God consciousness of her office and ray. They have taught us that many of the names we find in mythology belong to high cosmic beings. The Greeks and Romans retained an inner soul memory of ancient encounters with these beings possibly from their embodiments on Atlantis. After thousands of years, the consciousness of the people degenerated. As they became idolatrous and their inner sight diminished, they began to see the gods and goddesses more and more through human eyes, and thus they attributed to them human characteristics. The traits ascribed to the gods and goddesses in mythology do not necessarily reflect the great god reality of these cosmic beings. 
On Atlantis, Pallas Athena served under Vesta as a high priestess in the Temple of Truth. In Roman mythology, Vesta was worshipped as the goddess of the hearth. The Greeks knew her as Hestia. Each Roman and Greek household and city kept a fire burning perpetually in the honor of Vesta. In Rome, the sacred fire in the temple of Vesta was tended by six priestesses called Vestal Virgins. Ascended master students know Vesta as the feminine complement of beloved Helios, who was the sun god of the ancient Greeks. These great cosmic beings preside in the sun in the center of our own solar system. It is their god consciousness that sustains our physical solar system. In a later period of history, Pallas Athena was the directress of the temple virgins and oracles at Delphi. The oracles were messengers of the gods who delivered to the people the truth and wisdom of the law. Today, as the ascended lady master Pallas Athena, she serves on the fifth ray. The fifth ray is the emerald ray of the truth, healing, and science of God. Pallas Athena is a member of the karmic board, the supreme court of our solar system. The seven ascended masters who make up the karmic board adjudicate both world and individual karma. Pallas Athena also works with Hilarion, the Chohan or Lord of the Fifth Ray, and other healing and green ray masters. They minister to mankind from the Temple of Truth in the etheric octave above the island of Crete. Souls come to this retreat in their finer bodies at night during sleep to be instructed in the fine points of cosmic law the science of healing, mathematics, music, divine geometry, and the laws of alchemy and precipitation. And so many who come into our society today with ingenious opening of doors of higher understanding in these fields have surely studied under the great masters of truth who convoke their classes at the University of, of the Spirit in this retreat over Crete. Exactly 17 years ago today, which we just figured out about an hour ago, 17 years ago today on June 30th, 1976, the Ascended Lady Master Pallas Athena announced the coming revolution in higher consciousness. I cannot think of a more hand-picked Ascended Lady Master, a cosmic being, to go before us into all the nations of the earth than Pallas Athena. I think you will agree with me by the time I conclude my lecture today on the events in the life of Odysseus, Penelope, and Pallas Athena. This momentous dictation was given in Washington, D.C. at our July Freedom Class, Higher Consciousness. In that dictation, Pallas Athena firmly established her identity and mission in defense of the flame of truth. This dictation stirred the very depths of my soul. It was the battle cry, and it was she who sent me, together with St. Germain and El Moria, stumping America and the nations. Since that dictation, announcing the coming revolution in higher consciousness, I have stumped over a hundred cities across America and Canada, as well as cities in Ghana, Liberia, India, Europe, the British Isles, Australia, the Philippines. I have also conducted numerous seminars, lectures, and classes at the ranch across America, in Mexico, in South America. Pallas Athena is the twin flame of the Maha Chohan, the representative of the Holy Spirit in the earth. Together they are an indomitable pair in defense of truth. You need to stand upon that truth, invoke the mantle of both of these tremendous beings and know that the victory is yours when you believe in that truth and when you embody that truth. The Maha Chohan was embodied as the Greek poet Homer. And so he wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey with Pallas Athena as the central figure, his twin flame. Historically, little is known about Homer, but today most scholars believe he wrote his epic poems 
the Iliad and the Odyssey in the 8th or 9th century B.C. The Iliad tells the story of the last year of the Trojan War, while the Odyssey focuses on the return home of Odysseus, one of the heroes of the Trojan War. So today we're going to take a look at the Odyssey. Homer opens this symbolic tale with the goddess Athena appealing to Zeus for intercession for her protege, Odysseus. Throughout the Odyssey, it is moving to note Homer's clear devotion to Athena. The entire book reads as a beautiful, tender tribute to his ascended twin flame. Homer extols the relationship between the hero Odysseus and the goddess Pallas Athena, who guides and protects him throughout his many adventures. Perhaps Homer even saw himself as Odysseus, working hand in hand with his heavenly patron. I shall read to you passages from the Odyssey illustrating this special partnership between an ascended guru and an embodied disciple, or shall we say, the ascended twin flame of the embodied twin flame. For those of us who are in embodiment today, who have our twin flames ascended, it is probably the most ideal relationship that you can have because you have an ascended master who is rooting for you, who is bound and determined that you are going to pass your test, balance your karma, and make your ascension so that your team can move on in cosmic service and in helping the evolutions of Earth. And so those of you who may be looking around for your twin flame and haven't found him or her yet, that very special one may be just above you, as powerful as Pallas Athena, a known or an unknown ascended master who is guiding you every way, every footstep of your path and of all of the way home. So now I'm going to give you a little background to set the stage. Odysseus is the ruler of an island kingdom called Ithaca. Ten years before the start of the Odyssey, he left home. He left his home, his wife Penelope, and his infant son Telemachus to fight in the Trojan War. The Odyssey picks up the story after the war and tells of the great warrior's ten-year struggle to return to Ithaca. Homer describes for us an ancient world of heroes and chivalry that harks back to a golden age. Scholar David Frawley tells us, All the cultures of the ancient world look back to a mythical golden age, an era of profound inner awareness and simple outer living in which men lived in the presence of the gods. Nowhere else in Homer is the familiarity between goddess and man so apparent as between Athena and Odysseus. We see Athena's demeanor change as she interacts with different characters. With Telemachus, she is serious and reserved. With Penelope, she is gentle and compassionate. With Odysseus, she is almost playful even as she seriously tests him. This is especially evident in the scene where Athena first reveals herself to Odysseus. We open the Odyssey to Book 13. Odysseus has just been brought home to his native island, Ithaca, by the sailors of a dreamlike people called the Phaeacians. The Phaeacian king and people have given Odysseus many gifts amounting to a great treasure. Odysseus is sound asleep when the sailors place him carefully on the sand and pile up his treasure under a nearby olive tree. Remember that the olive tree is the emblem of Pallas Athena. Homer uses it as a repeated motif throughout the Odyssey. When Odysseus wakes up, he doesn't know where he is. The landscape of his native land looks strange to him because the goddess Athena has cast a gray mist around him. She wishes no one on the island to recognize him before he knows of the danger that awaits him. For ten years, Odysseus has passed through a series of trials, adventures, and initiations in his attempt to return home. When Odysseus wakes up on the island, he is distressed because he thinks he is lost. Nevertheless, he immediately turns to the pile of treasure beside him and starts counting up the items to make sure nothing has been lost. He does not know it, but the time has come for his first face-to-face -face encounter with Athena. Athena has guided him in the past, 
but she has not made herself known to him for many years. Now she comes to speak to Odysseus, disguised as a young shepherd boy. This is how the passage from the Odyssey reads. But soon Athena came to him from the nearby air, putting a young man's figure on, a shepherd like a king's son, all delicately made. She wore a cloak in two folds off her shoulders and sandals bound upon her shining feet. A hunting lance lay in her hands. At sight of her, Odysseus took heart, and he went forward to greet the lad, speaking out fair and clear. Friend, you are the first man I've laid eyes on here in this cove. Greetings. Do not feel alarmed or hostile coming across me. Only receive me into safety with my stores. Touching your knees, I ask it, as I might ask grace of a god. O oh, sir, advise me, what is this land and realm? Who are the people? Is it an island all distinct or part of the fertile mainland sloping to the sea? To this gray-eyed Athena answered, Stranger, you must come from the other end of nowhere, else you are a great booby, having to ask what place this is. It is no nameless country. Why, everyone has heard of it. The nations over on the dawn side toward the sun and westerners in cloudy lands of evening. The name of Ithaca has made its way even as far as Troy. Now Lord Odysseus, the long enduring, laughed in his heart, hearing his land described by Pallas Athena, daughter of Zeus, who rules the veering storm wind. And he answered her with ready speech, not that he told the truth, but just as she did, held back what he knew, weighing within himself at every step what he made up to serve his turn. Now we have to understand this passage in the context of Homer's world of heroes in which gods and men continually test each other. It is not so much that they are not telling the truth, but that they do not casually reveal their true identity or spiritual attainment, nor should any of you. This is also a law of the brotherhood. It is followed by all true initiates. They do not reveal who they are and what their mission is until the hour appointed by God. They never allow that hour to be dictated by their interrogators. As a result of this exchange, Odysseus knows that he has reached his home at last, but he does not allow himself to show his feelings or to reveal who he is. Instead, he spontaneously invents a tale to explain how he arrived on the island. At the end of his tale, it is Athena's turn to speak. The gray-eyed goddess Athena smiled and gave him a caress, her looks being changed now, so she seemed a woman, tall and beautiful and no doubt skilled at weaving splendid things. She answered briskly, Whoever gets around you must be sharp and guileful as a snake. Even a god might bow to you in ways of dissimulation. You, you chameleon, bottomless bag of tricks, here in your own country would you not give your stratagems a rest or stop spellbinding for an instant? You play a part as if it were your own tough skin. No more of this, though. Two of a kind we are, contrivers both. Of all men now alive, you are the best in plots and storytelling. My own fame is for wisdom among the gods. Would even you have guessed, I that am Pallas Athena, daughter of Zeus, that I am always with you in times of trial, a shield to you in battle, I who made the Phaeacians befriend you to a man. Athena is laughing as she admits that she has been testing Odysseus. Would he reveal his identity? Would he make a proud statement about being a king returned? Would he betray his emotion on coming home? Not Odysseus. His cautious and ingenious replies win Athena's high praise. Odysseus knows that he is being tested, and he never, never lets down his guard. He tests the spirits of those who come to him. He is the living embodiment of the motto of the Brotherhood, 
to know, to dare, to do, and to be silent. Continuing on in their exchange, Athena tells him why she is there. Now I am here again to counsel with you, but first to put away those gifts the Phaeacians gave you at departure. I planned it so. Then I can tell you of the gall and wormwood it is your lot to drink in your own hall. Patience, iron patience you must show, so give it out to neither man nor woman that you are back from wandering. Be silent under all injuries, even blows from men. Odysseus then answers, Can mortal man be sure of you on sight, even a sage, O mistress of disguises? Once you were fond of me, I am sure of that. Years ago when we Greeks made war in our generation upon Troy, but after we had sacked the shrines of Priam and put to sea, God scattered the Greeks. I never saw you after that, never knew you aboard with me to act as a shield in grievous times. And then he pleads for her reassurance that he has truly returned home. To this, the gray-eyed goddess answers, Always the same detachment. That is why I cannot fail you in your evil fortune, cool-headed, quick, well-spoken as you are. Would not another wandering man in joy make haste home to his wife and children? Not you, not yet. She is clearly pleased with him. He has passed his test. Athena then dispels the mist and shows him the island in all its beauty. Odysseus joyfully kisses the earth and offers up a prayer to the nymphs. Athena directs him to hide his treasure in a cave. Titus Burkhart sees the cave as the symbol of the heart in which Odysseus places all his treasures for safekeeping and then becomes like one poor in spirit, inwardly rich, and outwardly indigent. After Odysseus carries in all his treasure, Athena shuts the mouth of the cave with a stone, and she and Odysseus sit down together to discuss his situation. Odysseus has been absent from his kingdom for nearly 20 years. Many suitors, 108 to be exact, have tried to win the hand of his wife, Penelope, in order to gain control of the kingdom. Athena tells Odysseus that for three years the suitors have taken over his house and have behaved as though engaged to his wife. They have helped themselves to his cattle and provisions, feasting every night at his expense. At his expense. Athena tells Odysseus that Penelope has continued to grieve for him, holding off the suitors. On hearing about the suitors, Odysseus cries out, O gray-eyed one, fire my heart and brace me. I'll take on fighting men three hundred strong if you fight at my back, immortal lady. The gray-eyed goddess Athena answers him, No fear, but I shall be there. You'll go forward under my arm when the crux comes at last, and I foresee your vast floor stained with blood of this or that tall suitor who fed upon your cattle. Now for a while I shall transform you. Not a soul will know you, the clear skin of your arms and legs shriveled, your chestnut hair all gone, your body dressed in sacking that a man would gag to see, and the two eyes that were so brilliant, dirtied. Contemptible you shall seem to your enemies as to the wife and son you left behind. But join the swineherd first, the overseer of all your swine, a good soul now as ever, devoted to Penelope and your son. Speaking no more, she touched him with her wand, shriveled the clear skin of his arms and legs, made all his hair fall out, cast over him the wrinkled hide of an old man, and bleared both his eyes that were so bright. Then she clapped an old tunic of foul cloak upon him, tattered, filthy, stained by a greasy smoke, and over that a mangy big buck's skin. 
A staff she gave him, and a leaky knapsack with no strap but a loop of string. Odysseus accepts this amazing transformation without a word. Would you pass this test <laughs> if Elmoria gave it to you? You're watching Elizabeth Clare Prophet, world-renowned author and founder of Summit University. Summit University is located at the beautiful Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana, just north of Yellowstone National Park. If you'd like more information, call 1-800-323-5228. That's 1-800-323-5228. Odysseus hides the riches of his causal body in the cave and conceals the outward appearance of his royal birth, accepting temporarily the rags of his karma. The rags of his karma. Trusting Athena completely, Odysseus goes off to find the swineherd and thus begins to implement Athena's plan for the destruction of the suitors. Some commentators interpret the suitors as Odysseus's own unruly passions and interpret Penelope as his soul. If we see this story as an allegory of what is happening within Odysseus's consciousness, we can see that Odysseus has resolved to slay the inordinate desires that are trying to claim his soul. Athena has exposed his own dweller on the threshold. For the first time, Odysseus sees the various aspects of his lower self and recognizes them as the usurpers of his true identity. He is in fire to fight them to the death. He knows a fierce battle awaits him, but Athena has promised to be at his side. She has even foretold his victory. Athena does not appear to Odysseus again until after he has spent three days and nights in the swineherd's hut. He has learned all the news of the island, who was, who was faithful to him and who was not. Odysseus has impressed the swineherd with his many tales, and they have become fast friends. Telemachus, his son, returns from a trip that he had undertaken under Athena's direction. She has instructed him to go directly to the swineherd's mountain hut on his return. He thereby survives an assassination attempt by the suitors. The swineherd prepares to go to the palace to tell Penelope that her son is safe. Athena uses this opportunity to appear to Odysseus and tell him that it is time for him to reveal his identity to his son. Homer writes, Saying no more, she tipped her golden wand upon the man, making his cloak pure white and the knit tunic fresh around him. Life and young she made him, ruddy with sun, his jawline clean, the beard no longer grew upon his chin. And she withdrew when she had done. Then Lord Odysseus reappeared, and his son was thunderstruck. Fear in his eyes, he looked down and away as though it were a god and whispered, Stranger, you are no longer what you were just now. Your cloak is new, even your skin. You are one of the gods who rule the sweep of heaven. Be kind to us, we'll make you fair oblation and gifts of hammered gold. Have mercy on us. The noble and enduring man replied, No god. Why take me for a god? No, no, I am that father whom your boyhood lacked and suffered pain for lack of. I am he. Held back too long, the tears ran down his cheeks as he embraced his son. Telemachus, uncomprehending, wild with incredulity, cried out, You cannot be my father, Odysseus. Meddling spirits conceive this trick to twist the knife in me. No man of woman born could work these wonders by his own craft unless a god came into it with ease to turn him young or old at will. I swear you are in rags and old, and here you stand like one of the immortals. 
Odysseus brought his ranging mind to bear and said, This is not princely to be swept away by wonder at your father's presence. No other Odysseus will ever come, for he and I are one the same. His bitter fortune and his wanderings are mine. Twenty years gone, and I am back again on my own island. As for my change of skin, that is a charm. Athena, hope of soldiers, uses as she will. She has the knack to make me seem a beggar man sometimes, and sometimes young with finer clothes about me. It is no hard thing for the gods of heaven to glorify a man or bring him low. Odysseus is unattached, whether to rags or riches. He tells his son about Athena's plan to rout the suitors. Telemachus questions his father's judgment. He is discouraged by the seemingly impossible odds of 108 suitors against his father and himself. Odysseus explains that they will have Athena and her father Zeus to defend them. Telemachus answers that old that although the gods and goddesses are good defenders, perhaps they have other more important affairs to attend to. <laughs> Odysseus does not give in to his son's fears. He tells him to go ahead to the palace the next day and to mingle with the suitors. Odysseus will follow late with the swineherd and will remain disguised as a beggar. Father and son continue to discuss plans until the swineherd returns. Then Athena reappears also. Homer writes, And Athena, coming near, with one wrap of her wand, made of Odysseus an old man again, with rags about him, for if the swineherd knew his lord were there, he could not hold the news. Penelope would hear it from him. The next morning, Telemachus leaves the swineherd's hut and returns to the palace. Odysseus follows later with the swineherd. In disguise, Odysseus enters the dining hall where the suitors are feasting. His son directs him to go around to all and beg for food. Having done this, Odysseus sits down. Athena, unseen, takes her place beside him and directs him to beg again. She says, yes, try the suitors. You may collect a few more loaves and learn who are the decent lads and who are vicious, although not one can be excused from death. Odysseus obeys and provokes the wrath of the ringleader of the suitors, Antinous. He throws a stool at Odysseus and hits him on his right shoulder. Penelope rebukes Telemachus for allowing the guests to abuse a stranger, and Homer points out that Athena is continuing to test Odysseus. We can see this testing in the fact that the stool hits him on the right shoulder, showing he is vulnerable by his own karma. And so Homer writes, they for their part could not now be still or drop their mockery, for Athena wished Odysseus mortified still more. Athena, like Elmoria, has such love for her Chila that she wants him to prove himself to the ultimate level of passing his tests and initiations so that he can receive greater glory. It is interesting to note that Antinous means anti-mind. Odysseus' test is to recognize and slay his own anti-mind, his own carnal mind. Later that evening, after the suitors have gone home, Athena appears in the palace with a lamp. She has come to light the way for Odysseus and Telemachus to remove the weapons from the palace walls and hide them in the storeroom. Only Odysseus sees her. Telemachus does not. As Telemachus and his father perform this first act, leading to the slaughter, Athena lights the way for them with an unusually powerful lamp. The gods and light, namely victory, attend them. Light and fire in this poem accompany the victors. The symbolic meaning of Athena's act is clear. Victory awaits. 
After the beggar Odysseus has spent some time in the palace, Athena inspires Penelope to come downstairs and show herself to the suitors. Penelope has been living upstairs in isolation, grieving for her absent husband. She has promised to consider the suitor's offers of marriage when she has finished weaving a shroud for Odysseus's father. But she has delayed completing the shroud by unraveling at night the work she has done in the day. On the day that she is moved to descend into public view, Athena has made her especially beautiful. Penelope engages in a long conversation with the beggar and invites him to bathe and spend the night in the palace. Odysseus accepts, and the old nurse that he had as a child is assigned to bathe him. As the nurse washes his feet, she recognizes him by a childhood scar on his leg. Her eyes fill up with tears, and she tries to catch Penelope's attention. Athena distracts Penelope as Odysseus grabs the nurse takes her into his confidence and commands her to keep silent. He makes himself a bed of skins in the entryway. The old nurse covers him with a robe and leaves him for the night. Odysseus tosses and turns in bed, trying to think of a way to defeat the suitors. Athena comes to him and sweetly chides him. I am reading now from chapter 20. You are touching faith. Another man would trust some villainous mortal with no brains. And what am I? Your goddess guardian to the end in all your trials. Let it be plain as day. If fifty bands of men surround us and every sword sang for your blood, you could make off still with their cows and sheep. Now you too go to sleep. This all-night vigil wearies the flesh. You'll come out soon enough on the other side of trouble. Raining soft sleep on his eyes, the beautiful one was gone back to Olympus. At last we have come to the day of the great battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness in the palace at Ithaca and within Odysseus' own temple. Penelope has asked all the suitors to compete for her hand by submitting to a test of skill. Everyone is to string a mighty bow that Odysseus left behind and shoot an arrow through the holes of 12 axe heads lined up in a row. The suitors fail to even string the bow. They then ask to postpone the contest. In the meantime, the beggar has made his true identity known to the faithful swineherd and one other loyal supporter. Despite scornful objections from the suitors, the swineherd passes the bow to the beggar. In one motion, Odysseus strings the bow and then shoots an arrow straight through the axes. He nods to his son, the signal that the fight is to begin. He then throws off his rags, leaps onto the threshold, and calls to Apollo for help as he starts to shoot. Beginning with Antinous, Odysseus brings down one man for each arrow until his arrows run out. At this point, there is a crisis as the suitors start to fight back. Athena arrives disguised as mentor, Odysseus' old friend. Odysseus turns to him in joy, saying, O oh, mentor, join me in this fight. Remember how all my life I've been devoted to you, friend of my youth. For he guessed it was Athena, hope of soldiers. She challenges him to fight like he fought at Troy, but then astonishingly does not help him. <laughs> Homer writes, for all her fighting words, she gave no overpowering aid. Not yet. Father and son must prove their mettle still. Into the smoky air under the roof, the goddess merely darted to perch on a blackened beam no figure to be seen now but a swallow. So on they fight, but Athena spoils the suitors' shots. Their spears hit doorposts or walls or scatter harmlessly. Then suddenly as the battle continues and Telemachus downs a suitor, we are told. 
At this moment, that unmanning thundercloud, the Aegis, Athena's shield, took form aloft in the great hall. And the suitors, mad with fear at her great sign, stampeded like stung cattle by a river when the dread shimmering gadfly strikes in summer. Athena's aegis is her emblem of war, and it symbolizes her special powers. The very sight of it turns the tide of a battle. It strengthens the heroes and weakens the suitors. Soon all the suitors are slain, and the battle is won. But Odysseus forbids any jubilation. He does not feel pride over the suitors' deaths, for they have fallen by the hand and will of heaven. Odysseus sets all to work to purify the palace with fire and brimstone. He then hangs 12 maid servants who had allowed themselves to be seduced by the suitors. The nurse runs upstairs to tell Penelope that all the fighting is over and her husband has returned. Penelope starts to rejoice, but then doubts that the beggar hero is Odysseus. She says, some god has killed the suitors, a god sick of their arrogance and brutal malice, for they honored no one living. She comes downstairs and sits gazing at Odysseus, sometimes seeing her husband, sometimes seeing just blood and rags. Telemachus calls her cruel for remaining so aloof. Penelope replies, I am stunned, child. I cannot speak to him. I cannot question him. I cannot keep my eyes upon his face. If really he is Odysseus truly home, beyond all doubt, we two shall know each other better than you or anyone. There are secret signs we know, we two. Odysseus smiles and agrees to let her test him at her leisure. He bathes and changes his clothes. Athena lavishes beauty over his head and shoulders. Homer writes, She made him taller and massive too, with crisping hair in curls like petals of wild hyacinth, but all red golden. Still Penelope sits in silence. Odysseus asks the nurse to make up a bed for him. Penelope tells the nurse to place the bed that Odysseus had made before he left for Troy outside the bedchamber. Odysseus is suddenly angered. He turns on her in a flash, saying, Woman, by heaven, you've stung me now. Who dared to move my bed? No builder had the skill for that unless a god came down to turn the trick. No mortal in his best days could budget with a crowbar. There is our pact and pledge, our secret sign, built into that bed, my handiwork, and no one else's. Penelope has pushed him into revealing their secret. The palace was built around an olive tree, and Odysseus had designed their bed so that the trunk formed one of the bedposts. Therefore, the bed was immovable. Odysseus cries, there's our sign, I know no more. Penelope runs to him in tears and throws her arms around his neck. Of course, she has not moved the bed. She knows now that it is truly Odysseus returned. The maid in waiting then lights her lord and lady to their chamber with bright fire brands. Athena slows the night and stays the dawn until Odysseus has told of all his adventures and the reunited pair have had their fill of love and sleep. Thus ends the story of Odysseus' victory over the forces of darkness within and without. The entire story is a blueprint for you, every Chila on the path. And so, with the assistance of his ascended sponsor, Odysseus successfully routes the interlopers in his own temple. 
when you see all the principal characters of the Odyssey as aspects of the consciousness of Odysseus, it opens endless doors of interpretation. I commend you to your own meditation on this book and its deeper mysteries. I want you to know I'm not sure how I knew this, but I knew this when I was in college. I knew that everyone I met, everything I saw, every circumstance I was involved in was in some way a lesson, a testing of my soul, and an outpicturing of things inside of me that I had to look at objectively and decide, are you going to get rid of this? Do you want to find St. Germain bad enough that you're going to surrender this part of yourself and that part of yourself and the next part of yourself so that you will be ready for this teacher. Some of you know that I found the books on St. Germain when I was 18 in my mother's library. And St. Germain quickened me and touched me in that moment, though I did not see him. His presence was unmistakable as I look back on that event, just as I was leaving for college. But I spent the next five years looking for him, looking for someone, anyone who knew him. And I knew very quickly that I was not finding him because he was playing hide and seek with me because I wasn't ready for St. Germain. I was not ready because the law is when the pupil is ready, the master appears. So I set about trying to determine what in me was not ready, what I had to undo, what I had to do better, and I became a student of myself, my real self, and my unreal self, and I made it a practice to leave my dorm in the evening after studying, walking up and down the streets of Brookline, Massachusetts, near Boston University, walking and talking with God. Walking and talking with God every day. Even if St. Germain wasn't going to come and get me right now, I would walk and talk with God, and I would come to an understanding of what it was in me that was not acceptable to the Ascended Masters. I commend you to this study of yourself and to the realization that much that you encounter is the outpicturing of yourself. You can rise in consciousness through decrees. You can set force fields around yourself of great light. But the day-to-day -day descent of karma comes to you as a cosmic teacher with great lessons. If you will learn the lessons and really learn to see yourself as others see you and not defend yourself against their interpretations, but really be willing to look at yourself, you will find that you will never stop learning. You will quickly come to an understanding why you embody through the parents you embody through, what lessons you should have learned if you didn't learn them vis-a-vis -vis your parents, who are your first karma in life. And that is why it's very important to make absolute peace with your parents. If you are going around kind of effacing, defacing the ego and recognizing that your real self is your higher self, is the living Christ in you, you will learn your lessons very, very quickly. But if you don't want to see what you're really made of, if you're not ready to take yourself apart, put yourself together again, see all the filthy rags, earn the right to wear the princely garments, you will make little progress in this life. So please, work on your psychology. Get detached. Be objective. Don't ever, ever, ever condemn yourself. Just resolve to do better when you see you're not pleased with something you said or did. Let's make it simple. Let's not go through life under this tremendous, horrendous spirit of condemnation of the consciousness of sin and guilt and eternal damnation that is not the true doctrine of Jesus Christ or Gautama Buddha. God has made a place for us that is in heaven or hell, and that place is called the earth. And the earth itself is just exactly what we need right now, so let's make the best of it and never deny the joy of God in your heart. If you deny joy and allow yourself to be unjoyous, absent joy, what are you doing? You are breaking Jesus' heart. Because what did he say to his disciples in the very end? 
that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. We're really not disciples of Jesus Christ or Gautama Buddha if we are not joyous, if we can't give the cup of joy, not when everything is happy, 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 but in times of real burden, of being bowed down, to still remember that we are joyous because someone needs the joy of the Lord. You have been watching Elizabeth Clare Prophet. This program is presented by Summit University, Box 5000, Livingston, Montana, 59047, 5000. For free information on personal growth and spirituality, call 1-800-323-5228.